This is a Labour Lives interview with Mr Steve McCabe MP and it's been conducted in Kings Heath in Birmingham. Today is the 15th of July 2016. Uh, good morning Mr McCabe and thank you for agreeing to be interviewed by Labour Lives. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I wonder if I could um, take you back to um, not perhaps the beginning of your career but um, where you came from and how you ended up in Birmingham. Uh, I grew up in uh, Port Glasgow, which is a, a shipping uh, town, a shipbuilding town in the west coast of Scotland, uh, near Greenock, about 25 miles from Glasgow. Uh, I say it was a shipbuilding town, it was a shipbuilding town. When I was a, a young man growing up, uh, probably about 85% of the male population worked in the shipyards. Uh, I've got a vivid memory of being a child looking out the kitchen window in the morning and each uh, front door would open or garden gate would open and the men would come out with little uh, scone hats or bonnets on uh, with their haversack over their shoulders and they would pr process down the road in a line all making their way to the shipyard. So that was uh, Port Glasgow. Uh, in fact, the, the local secondary school uh, was built around the technical block, so it was the centrepiece of the school. And the story at the time was that uh, uh, lads in particular were um, ranked uh, in terms of uh, trades in the shipyard, so clever boys went to work in the drawing office and then we pr uh, process through the trades, electricians, welders, burners, joiners. Uh, uh, I have to say I escaped and uh, decided not to have a career in the shipyards, which considering there's only one little repair l yard left now was probably quite a smart move. So um, uh, you're, you were born in 1955. Um, so we're talking about uh, you being, um, uh, say, 10, 12, going to um, uh, secondary school in, in the mid-60s. Um, were you still in Port Glasgow at that time? Yes, yes. I didn't leave Port Glasgow until I was about 19, 18, 19. Uh, and that was to go off to college or, or what? Yeah, yeah I, went through, I went to do a social work training programme at uh, Murray House in Edinburgh. All right, OK. Um, I never worked in Scotland despite training there. I, I worked uh, originally in Wolverhampton and I specialised for quite a long time in working with young offenders uh, and I also had a period when I uh, lectured in social work. Yeah. So I came to Wolverhampton in 77. I thought I was coming for 12 months. Uh, it never quite worked out like that. Well, you saw some challenging times when you did come to Birmingham at that time. We obviously um, uh, uh, then had a um, uh, the uh, 1979 election. Were you at that time a member of the Labour Party? Uh, I think I was a member. I can't actually, to be honest, uh, remember uh, whether I was a member or not. But I do remember that uh, working in that election in... Uh, Wolverhampton, I worked for Dennis Turner, uh, who, who I don't think Dennis was actually the Member of Parliament at the time, I think he was a Billsley councillor, but uh, I, I recall um, standard stuff that people will remember, uh, basic door knocking and driving lots of uh, people to the polling station and working until right up until it was dark, and then I think it was Wolverhampton Civic Hall where they had the, the uh, I wasn't actually at the counts I think they had a kind of ante room that people went I remember being slumped in a chair watching the results coming in and just feeling about as sick <laughs> as everybody else in the room <clears throat> with the exception that uh, that was the night uh, of Mrs Thatcher's great victory except there was a chap called Teddy Taylor who was intended to be the Tory Secretary of State for Scotland but he lost his seat in Cathcart that night. He went on subsequently to become the MP for Southend as I recall. But uh, 
so we were all sitting slumped in the chairs looking pretty glum and Teddy Taylor's result came in and I jumped to my feet and shouted and everybody looked at me as if I was a bit bonkers <laughs> but uh, I, I, I you know I was one of the few people in the room who kind of recognised Teddy Taylor losing was quite a big event a, a Labour family? Yes, I didn't have any member of my family who who was uh, active in the sense that they were a local councillor or a representative uh, in any sense like that. But I think it was very common. I, I mean, I can recall from quite an early age listening to quite strong uh, discussions with uh, in the house. Uh, lots of people, you know, arguing, discussing different aspects of and what was happening in the political situation. Uh, my grandmother had very strong views. My uh, grandfather uh, had equally trenchant opinions. Uh, my my mother had uh, quite strong views uh, about um, issues like you know, fairness and justice. Uh, which is, I recall that from quite a, an early age. And... Um, God, I don't want to sound like William Hague, but, you know, I was kind of interested from quite a young age in current affairs, so I kind of knew things like who was the Prime Minister, who were members of the government. I used to kind of look at things like that. It interested me. Of course, at that time, um, uh, Labour essentially ran Scotland. Um, Glasgow was a totally Labour seat. Um, and uh, the unions and councillors and MPs were all drawn from the Labour Party essentially um, though I think there had been a mid-70s um, sort of resurgence of um, the uh, SNP but in, in, in no real um, form at that time uh, we have a now a, a totally different uh, position in, uh, in Scotland uh, what's your feelings about um, uh, Scotland at the moment um, uh, and its uh, political uh, hue, if I can put it that way? Yeah, well, I mean, as you say, uh, Labour were, were a, a total dominant force. The kind of local joke was you could put up a collie dog with a Labour rosette and it would win in Scotland at those times. Uh, there's also, I remember, that uh, a certain gentleman called uh, Wee Norrie Lament stood in uh, Port Glasgow and he uh, got a derisory vote but later went on to reinvent himself as Norman Lamont and became rather well known in England <laughs> but not so, not, so, not so popular when he stood in Port Glasgow I mean I guess actually I, I'm saddened and shocked uh, at what's happened in Scotland but but I do think Labour completely lost its way in Scotland. Uh, I, I remember being up there during the referendum campaign uh, and I spent some time working in Greenock, um, um, which, you know, is part of the, the constituency, I think, now is Greenock and Port Glasgow. Uh, uh, so, I mean, it was an area I knew well and I remember knocking doors during the referendum and people looking at me with a kind of perplexed expression saying well you know what are you doing on my doorstep because actually Labour had essentially lost contact I think with uh, with the the public in Scotland I think it, it kind of shows um, I think the real message of Scotland is that you cannot afford to take votes for granted anywhere uh, and um Labour probably spent far too long uh, thinking that they could take uh, the, the Scottish people for granted and I, I just think they completely lost touch uh, and the the determination in the, the, the last election of the people of Scotland to sh teach them a lesson and to show them is what I think stands out. I, I'm not wholly convinced that, that there is some massive surge to nationalism in Scotland. I think it may be a temporary phenomenon. I think, uh, if I'm truthful, uh, Nicola Sturgeon's a very impressive MP. Um, the, the 
nationalist uh, government in Scotland has had a relatively good run, although it may be coming to an end. But I'm not convinced there's been some mass conversion. I think it was much more about teaching Labour a lesson. I think we, we live we live in an age where there's a distrust of politics, where there's um, a proliferation uh, of, of news um, and propaganda on social media, um, uh, where, where people um, engage with their politics differently. They, by and large, the days of the town hall meeting are over. Uh, the days of actually reading leaflets from political parties are probably over, in my judgment. People get their get their, and and the communities that people belong to are quite often virtual communities. So I mean, I think it's a you know it's a very different age, and it. it my hunch is it, it requires a slightly different style of politics. Can I take you back then to um, when you decided to uh, uh, get involved in politics? Um, the records show that you were a, a Labour councillor in 1990, but had you stood before that period of time anywhere? No, no, I hadn't. Um, I mean, basically, I think... I'm quite often asked this question about how did I get into it. I think there are two kind of defining points for me. The first one is, one of the things that I learned in social work was that if you're encountering uh, an individual with a particular problem or difficulty, it's possible at a social work level to intervene and to say, you know, well, have you thought about this? If you were to structure it that way or approach it this way, you could change a bit of your life, you could make this different but if you're encountering one after another an individual ind individuals with the same essentially the same problem problems of poverty housing uh, uh, lack of support for children that, that's not uh, the sort of things that are amenable to individual social work intervention that, that's about policy uh, and so, I mean, I think actually one of the things that convinced me um, that I had to get much more active in politics was that I began to see through my work as a social worker that, that the solutions didn't lie in individual attempts to change people's behaviour. The solutions lay in changes to policy. Uh, and my my memory is that the kind of defining moment for me was when... Uh, Margaret Thatcher won the 83 election and I thought God almighty there will never be a Labour government again and we are going to be subject to some kind of right wing dictatorship for the rest of my life uh, I, and that I think I remember that being the moment that had quite a decisive impact on me and I decided at that point that I should stop kind of muttering and complaining about these things with friends in the pub and other places and I should put a lot more effort into working for and supporting the, the Labour Party uh, and I did from about there on in and when I settled in Birmingham which I think was about 86, 87 um, you know I just got very involved in the, the local party uh, and I didn't actually set out strangely enough to become a councillor I, I, I'm like a lot of people in the Labour Party if you're the person in the room that doesn't move fast enough you often end up with a job so I think my original experience uh, I can't remember of becoming the branch I think it was I was the branch chair was really more about you could do it Steve rather than <laughs> You know, me uh, running for the post or some great sense of acclamation. I think it was a kind of, well, who could do it? Uh, and actually then somebody said, well, have you thought of standing for the council? And I said yes, but thinking at some point in the future. Uh, and the next thing I knew was people were saying, well, you should be our, uh, our candidate for 1990. And so, you know, it kind of... Uh, I don't mean it happened by accident and that sounds as if, oh, it just happened. Uh, obviously there was some, there was quite a deliberate element of choice, as I say, I trace it back to around about 83, the time I became much more focused on wanting to influence politics and change. But I think that was the kind of route. 1990, you then remain a councillor for two terms. 
um, till 1998. Um, what was Birmingham uh, politics like for you when you first went into the council chamber? I've asked a number of people what it was actually like. I mean, it was a, a council chamber that has got a, a, a great history behind it, um, uh, many problems in, in, in the 1990s. You were the councillor for which area? Brownwood, which is uh, part of um, my current constituency. It's the area broadly from about the top end of... Uh, just just beyond, just the garage beyond Howard Road on the Alcester Road up to uh, the Druid's Heath Estate mm -hmm. and the, the bits kind of right and left of that. Um, how would I describe it? Um, Well, the, the Lab Labour Party were running the council uh, at the time. Um, they weren't an immensely popular group. There were lots of complaints about the way the group was organised. I think that's quite a common feature of the Labour group in Birmingham, I, I've subsequently learned. Uh, big disputes about the way some of the budget choices were being made, uh, a sense that maybe not enough was being spent on education, lots of concern about schools opting out. In those days it was grant maintained status. Uh, a sense that maybe not enough priority for things like housing and social issues. Uh, maybe too much focus on city centre redesign. It wasn't a particularly happy group, I think that's how I would describe it. Uh, quite well run by Dick Knowles at the time who you know was a wily uh, character um, but I wouldn't say it was a particularly happy experience the chamber itself I did find quite interesting I kind of quite liked the the image of it. Um, it is as you say it's a lovely the chamber itself is actually quite attractive although I remember taking my mother God bless her <laughs> she died a couple of years ago I remember taking my mother to see it uh, and saying, don't you think it's really nice? And she said, well, it is, son. And she ran her finger along it, and she said, but there's nobody dust in here, <laughs> which I thought was quite, you know, it was typical horror. You know? um, so, I mean, I, in a way, there were bits of it I liked. I liked to see... Uh, I spent a lot of my early days kind of watching people in the chamber and looking at different styles and trying to weigh up in my own mind what I thought was talent and what I thought was showmanship um, I, and I find the Labour group, if I'm really truthful I find the Labour group at times remarkably petty and I find it quite difficult to believe that you know this was people making decisions about things that really mattered, I thought it was incredibly petty, it reminded me <coughs> excuse me of that old story that this is apocryphal obviously but it reminded me of that old story about the the councillors who spend uh, you know like two minutes discussing the potential nuclear crisis and uh, uh, several hours discussing uh, the bicycle shed because they know about the bicycle shed and I kind of think that's how it came across to me at the time. There is always a tension in um, uh, certainly in Labour politics in, in the city and I'd agree with you entirely you decide to stay for um, uh, two terms, but at that point you must have been looking around to think about um, uh, considering um, uh, Parliament. What, where, where, why did you decide to um, uh, seek a, a nomination? Because you sought the nomination in Hall Green, um, a traditional, um, if you like, uh, Labour, uh, not a traditional, rather, Labour area, a place that had been held by the Tories for forever. Well, what actually happened was, um, um, you know, like all of these things, as I say, there's an element of luck and chance that I've always believed in politics. What actually happened was after I'd been on the council a couple of years, I mean, my background was social work. I ended up on a committee um, called the Technical Services Committee, which was really about engineers, highways, potholes. I think it included toilets in those days, public toilets. Uh, uh, and I assumed it was because the secretary of the group thought it had the word services in it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been a bit facetious. But anyway, I ended up in this committee. And at the time, after I'd been on the council a couple of years, there was this um, decision or proposal emerged to build three major dual carriageways 
uh, in the south of Birmingham, one on the Stratford Road, one on the Alcester Road, and a massive extension of the Coventry Road uh, one. And the effect of this in in uh, King's Heath and the Alcester Road would have been they would have built this huge tunnel and virtually cut the high street off from a bit like we we see in parts of the Coventry Road. And there was massive um, local opposition to it and people saying, you know, why are we doing this? What's this about? It was very, it's very hostile. And I, I was in the, I was in the, the Labour Technical Services Committee pre-group meeting before the, the committee met and Dick Knowles, who was leader, was wheeled in to remind us about the whip because we were being asked to vote for this proposal. And the more I thought, I thought, this is crackers. So I, I scribbled an amendment onto the bottom of it, which basically said, um, but before we do this, um, there's going to be a proper evaluation of the, the options and a proper consultation with local people. Uh, and I shoved it under his nose. And he could obviously read that, you know, the mood in the group was bad. And he was, as I say, he was a very canny operator. Uh, Dick knows. I feel I learned a lot from him. I, I greatly really like him and respect him. But um, and in in the end, I don't think I think he barely exchanged a couple of words with me in the two years I'd been on the council up until that point. But he decided that uh, we should have this amendment, and this became the route for Labour to extricate itself from this kind of mess. Uh, and Dick uh, phoned me up that evening like I was his long lost son and uh, asked me how it had gone at the committee and I thought, what's going on here? But that's what I explained. And then he asked to see me and asked me what I meant by, you know, consultation and, and potential. And he asked me to take charge of a thing which became the South Birmingham study where we actually conducted quite an extensive uh, analysis of the journeys that people made in South Birmingham and what we discovered was that all the proposals were premised on end-to-end -end journeys from about the M40 to the city centre. Actually, most of the journeys were cross journeys. And so the solution had to be different from the proposition. Uh, and this led to things like bus lanes, more pedestrian crossings, uh, uh, reallocating road space, the development of a cycling strategy. So, I mean, it became the shift in policy uh, and as a result of that, um, I think it was the following year or so, I, I became the the new chair of the Technical Services Committee. And I guess the truth is I reached a stage as we were approaching the, the, the 97 election, I mean it was somewhere after 92, I don't remember the exact time, but we'd lost in 92 and I was again quite frustrated about that campaign and I had very strong views about things that should have been done and didn't happen, you know, uh, possibly one of my problems, I've always got strong views and they don't always go down well, but uh, I, I decided in the end that I would really quite like to have a crack at Hall Green, which was uh, Brandwood Ward, which I represented and where I lived was part of that constituency and I decided I'd like to have a crack at that seat and I was very conscious that it was a Tory seat, it had never been a Labour seat since its creation but I felt that the tide was turning uh, I was a fan, I make no apologies for the fact that I was a fan of Tony Blair and I thought that the, the work that was going on with him and Gordon Brown to refashion Labour was right uh, so, I mean, I think I've just reached a point where I thought, well, it's now or never. And so I decided to go for it. I'm partly on the basis that I thought, I've got to get this out of my system. If I go for it and it doesn't happen, that will be okay. But I don't want to be sitting in a bar somewhere when I'm 60 odd saying, oh, I could have done, uh, you know. So I think I just made up, as I quite often do in life, I made a choice that I was going to have a crack at it and you know uh, again I was fortunate I, I'm not saying I didn't put an effort to win the nomination I did I worked quite hard I, I was very focused about it but I was also very fortunate I mean Labour had a landslide uh, 
result in 97 and I was a beneficiary of, of, of that whole phenomenon. So, I mean, at various times in my life I've been very lucky in politics. 1990 was poll tax year, so, so it wasn't that hard to win Brandwood when I first became a councillor. 97 was a Labour landslide, it wasn't that hard to overturn uh, I think what was then about a three and a half thousand Tory uh, majority, but of course we overturned it very well. I, I ended up with a majority of about eight and a half thousand. It was a very good result. So you're in your early forties then, um, but you'd had a hinterland. Because I'd like to ask you a brief question about the the route that some of your colleagues in Westminster now take. They have the political route. They don't get involved in local politics in the same way that you did by being a representative in the local council. Many of them become special advisors. Many of them don't have the qualifications that you have and the expertise that you can bring to Westminster uh, as a social worker, as somebody who could who was advising at the highest levels. So do you think, in a way, people should step back, get a career and then think about politics? Or what, what are your comments about that now? The perception that people see it as a career rather than a vocation yeah well i think the short answer is i agree with that i i'm not saying it can be the same for everyone and there may well be you know good reasons for why some people pursue a kind of route from special advisor to mp but i think there are too many people do that too many people think there is a parliamentary route that is leave university get a job for an MP, become a special advisor, become an MP, become a minister. And it's almost like, you know, that's what politics is. It's a, it's a career, it's a conveyor belt. I, I, I think that produces too many folk who are too similar, who have too little experience of life, um, who have too little in terms of personal resource to fall back on. So I think it's creating a political class and it may actually explain why there is a sense of detachment from people and their representatives. So I, I think a much healthier mix of people who've got... Who, you know, I'm not saying you've got to be any certain age or any certain type of person, but I think you need to have a slightly broader base of experience. I think good to have had experience of work uh, in some other field or area. Uh, very good to have a local government background. Very interesting that Theresa May, I think, is the only Prime Minister uh, we've ever had, or certainly in any recent times, who herself has got a local government background. Uh, I think Attlee might have done. Uh, yes, I'm yeah, saying. In recent, recent times, yes. Uh, so... Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a real strong argument for saying that you, you really shouldn't be putting yourself forward unless you've done something else. And I can only say for myself that I couldn't have done... What, I, I mean, I've, I've been an MP now for, well, next year, 20 years. I couldn't have done that, and I couldn't have survived the things that have happened, and I couldn't do the job that I, I, I'm I think I'm required to do without my experience of both having been a counsellor and having been a social worker. Those are the things that I fall back on when I'm trying to work out what do I do here. So I think the world is just very different. And I think that the real, um, I was going to say trick, that sounds like, I mean, it's a, a game, but I think the real essence of, of it now is what you do in Westminster should be rooted on your, your, in your experience in your constituency. The need is to constantly think about your constituency. How does this affect my constituents? If we vote for this, who will be the beneficiaries? Who will be the losers? How will that affect that little business down the road in Dogpool Lane? Or what will that do to that poor couple uh, who, whose house is uh, going to fall down if they get away with this. And I think, I think it's just become much more important to be a representative of your community. Uh, and I don't think it... I, I think because the world is shrinking in terms of media and contact and access to information, it's vital that the politician is able to relate the Westminster world to their own constituency experience. I mean, it's no accident that most of my staffing resources are in my constituency because I think Selly Oak and how does Selly Oak 
uh, benefit or lose from what happens in Westminster and I think that's the way it has to be these days. There obviously needs to be considerable discipline in the um, uh, party and uh, perhaps that brings us to the, the current um, uh, difficulties. I wanted to ask you though that you were a whip there was. So y y you were um, bringing people into um, line on occasions, were you not, as a government whip? What was that like as a job? Some people say that um, the whips department um, uh, is uh, where the dark arts are operated. Uh, did you operate in the dark arts, in the, in the dark places of Westminster? Uh, well, that's not how I would describe it. Uh, I was a whip when I was a whip both for Tony Blair's government and for Gordon Brown's government and there were some very difficult times. Look, the essential job of the Whips organisation is to get the government's business through. The essential job of the opposition is to waste time and frustrate the government's attempts to deliver its programme. So if you're, the Whips are there to try and make sure the government gets its business through, that's our primary purpose. Uh, but you do that by understanding, I mean, you have two real kind of areas of responsibility. One is usually to a department. I, I whipped at the DTI under Alistair Darling. I whipped at Health under Alan Johnson at the Home Office under Jackie Smith and Alan Johnson. So, I mean, you get to know a lot about the department, the department's business things that could be difficult, how that needs to be managed. With because you have to translate that to the reluctant uh, yeah, uh, um, yeah. MPs on occasion. And you're constantly feeding back to your colleagues and the chief whip, look, this is coming up, this is where I foresee the problems and the pitfalls, this is how we might tackle it. So, I mean, I think that is just simply about trying to be alert to what's going on. And you do that by keeping your ear to the ground, in interacting with colleagues. You also have a you know, a group of regional colleagues for whom you're responsible, you do, I think you do that job by knowing them, meeting them, understanding them. And I wouldn't say, you know, I hear all these things about the black arts. I mean, I've, I've never seen a black book in my life and I don't kind of really understand. I, I, Perhaps it's only the Tories who have them. Maybe, it may, well, they'd have lots of things to put in their black book, so I can understand that. But uh, I, I think it's more likely... I, you know, I really say that I think whipping in this day and age is a bit closer to something like the Human Resources Department of any organisation. You need to know your colleagues, you need to know what they're worried about, what they're good at, what their talents are, what makes them tick, um, what will influence them. And I think, you know, that would be the same if I was managing a school or a small business. Uh, any workforce uh, and I think you know that's how I would describe whipping it's about making damn sure that the opposition don't succeed in frustrating the government's attempts to deliver its programme and doing everything in your power to make sure that your colleagues stay on board uh, and sometimes you know you use a range of persuasive methods to try and get there obviously <laughs> Does your history in the Whips department inform your views about Jeremy Corbyn? He, of course, uh, uh, was a serial um, voter against his own government some 500 times, I believe, uh, in various measures. D do you think that uh, that has informed uh, your, if you like, we used the word trenchant um, before, but I think you've made trenchant views about um, Jeremy Corbyn and where we are at the moment. So does that inform it or does it... I mean, what I'm really trying to say is there is a, a broad church of the Labour Party. Would you define yourself as a socialist through and through equally as much as people on the left say, I'm a socialist, they're a Blairite, they're in that party, they're in that faction. Where does Steve McCabe sit in the political pantheon in the year 2016? Well, I'm not and have never been a Blairite or a Brownie or a part of any other faction, actually. I'm not really uh, that interested in those kind of labels and factions. I mean, I freely confess I was a great admirer of Tony Blair. I believe that he did a phenomenal job for our party. I know that Iraq has been a terrible experience and I understand why people have really strong views on that. But, uh, you know, I think if you look at the Blair government... 
governments because you did win three elections uh, in its totality I think uh, it's a pretty good story but uh, I mean I'm not part of any faction never have been um, what, uh, I, and to be fair about Jeremy I mean I didn't vote for him uh, but I have spent the best part of uh, the last year trying to work with him and that the regime that he represents uh, the problem is I have come to the conclusion that it's it's failing and it's going to fail and when it fails it's going to destroy the Labour Party that's why I realise there are lots of other people see it differently and will have different conclusions that's my honest conclusion the only part of being a whip that informs it is I find it bizarre that I'm uh, harangued by people demanding loyalty to the leadership um, in the case of Jeremy, when Jeremy himself, of course, uh, and I'm told he's got this massive mandate, but, you know, Neil Kinnock won 71% of the leadership vote, uh, rather larger than Jeremy's uh, current mandate, but it didn't stop Jeremy organising uh, to try and uh, depose him as leader when he ran Tony Benn's campaign. He did vote with regularity uh, against the government. In fact, the joke in the Whip's office at the time was there isn't any point in asking Jeremy, you'll just tip him off so that he knows when he turn up to vote against. Uh, so, you know, um, I, I find appeals for loyalty a bit farcical when they're put to me in these situations. Jeremy himself, his own uh, word is that um, it's all very well to ask for loyalty but you must be true to your own beliefs and your own values and what you think is the right thing to do. And as long as Jeremy's leader, I'm going to follow that suggestion from him and that's the way I will deal with, with it because I don't think there's anything else. I believe that the primary purpose of the Labour Party is to try and elect Labour councillors and have Labour counts, Labour run councils and to try and get a parliamentary majority so that we can do our best to change policy to make it better for people. As I said, the key thing that changed me to move to politics from social work was this is wrong, the policy is wrong, we've got to change it. I believe that's our purpose, our reason for being. So I don't want to be part of a protest group. I would have joined the Socialist Worker Party if I'd wanted to behave with that kind of politics. I don't believe that is the route to making people's lives better. I, and much as I am really fond of party members and I wouldn't be able to do any of the things that I do in my constituency without the voluntary support and the effort and the hours that people put in for me, stuffing envelopes, making phone calls, knocking doors. You know, at the end of the day, 250,000 members versus the 10 or 11 million people that we need to win a Labour majority. You have to think about that. There are people in Selly Oak who desperately need a Labour government. They might never join the Labour Party, they might never knock a door, they might never do any of those things, but they're the people we exist to try and help. And I don't think we will help them by being part of a narrow protest group. I think I think that's where Jeremy uh, uh, and his immediate associates are wrong. I think they haven't recognised that the primary purpose is the greatest good of the greatest number. Last question. The the dichotomy in the Labour Party is, as you rightly say, the membership versus the PLP, and there is a considerable disconnect. Did, therefore, Ed Miliband make a considerable mistake in moving to one person, one vote, when you had electoral colleges in the uh, previous years? Because the Neil Kinnock was voted in on an electoral college of essentially a third, a third, a third. Third membership, third union, third PLP. So is there, in reality, from what you're saying, a need to move away from this one member, one vote? Because essentially, as the numbers stack up at the moment, it looks, if he is continuing towards September, there is a high likelihood that it either will be very close 
in which case that could be the, the worst of all results in terms of uh, Jeremy Corbyn being re-elected or not. But we could get to a situation where there could be open warfare in the party. So what, what do you see for the future? If you do see a future for the Labour Party, you're going to remain, I take it, in the Labour Party. You're not going anywhere, I take it. This is your Labour Party. Um, well, I mean, I certainly don't expect to be going anywhere. Uh, uh, as I say, I regard myself as Labour through and through. I have my own views uh, on what Labour is for and what it's about and the way I want to be Labour. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm in politics. I expect people to disagree with me. And I take the view that I'm not going to be all things to all people. You know, it's better to be honest and straight sometimes and say... You're not going to like this, but this is my view, and better to tell people, I think, when you don't agree with them. I hate these folk who say, I agree with you and you and you. I think they're phonies, uh, so I detest that. Um, whether whether Ed Miliband made a mistake or not, I don't know, and I don't actually personally think it was all down to him. I mean, these were decisions that were taken by a number of people. What I think was wrong... So, I guess my proposition is that I'm not sure I want to go back to an electoral college. I like the principle of one member, one vote. But I think there are certain key rules in it. Uh, I'm not sure that um, a £3 membership uh, giving you exactly the same rights as a full party member is really equitable. Uh, I don't think that. I've never heard of a situation where you can sign people up and let them join the party in the midst of an election which is what happened during Jeremy Corbyn's election. So the idea that there is a freeze date uh, and that you have to have been either a member or a registered supporter, in my view, I would say maybe 12 or 18 months, I think it is ridiculous that you can join the Labour Party on Thursday and vote for the leader on Friday. I, I'm sorry, but you know, I think if party membership means anything, then you should be part of it. We have a long, proud tradition. So I think it's not so much about about was he wrong to do that I think that you have to have better rules around what a, what a member is and what a registered, registered supporter is and that's about the way the system is administered uh, but the principle of one member one vote I, I think I agree with that I was never a great fan of the block vote um, I think it, it you know, outlived its usefulness. I think it's right that uh, members should have their say. And of course, the, the safeguard uh, to ensure that you don't get someone who is completely out of touch with their parliamentary colleagues is the nomination structure. But at the uh, uh, leadership election last year, Labour MPs who didn't support Jeremy nominated him. That was, you know, that was them. That was their uh silly behaviour uh, and the decision recently of the NEC to say that he doesn't need to be nominated has of course is an interpretation of the rules which I don't really agree with. I would say if you get an 80% no confidence motion it's probably quite reasonable that you should have to get a threshold of nominations before you can stand again. I'm not too sure of any other situation that's apart from dictatorships that spring to mind where you can have so little support uh, and still be able to carry on. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think it's about... Uh, I think it's about the way it's structured, and I think it's about people being honest. I would never nominate anybody I wasn't going to vote for. Steve McCabe, thank you for speaking to Labour Lives. Pleasure.